Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Thank you so much for returning for another segment of Health Professional Radio. Whether healthcare workers are on the front line treating patients or maybe working behind the scenes, the ability to successfully navigate change, rise above adversity, and triumph boil down to one single word. That word is resilience. Well, Anne Grady is joining us here, keynote speaker on resilience and leadership, to talk about resilience toolbox strategies that can help healthcare workers to maybe take some time for self-care and avoid burnout. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Anne. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Neil. Thank you for having me. Well, give us a little bit of uh, your professional background and then talk about this ability to reset and why it's so important to healthcare workers especially. Okay. Well, I am an entrepreneur and an author of three books, and I work with organizations around the globe to help them work better, um, think better, be able to increase performance by building the skills, habits, and behaviors needed to navigate uncertainty and change and build resilience in the face of adversity. You know, we heard a lot about uh, professional burnout among our healthcare professionals um, at the beginning. And of course, even now with the pandemic and this triple-demic, are there some effective strategies to avoid this burnout, this uh, resilience toolbox uh, that I mentioned in the opening? Talk about that if you would. So prior to the pandemic, healthcare workers were at twice the risk of burnout. About 40% of healthcare workers reported depression and suicidal ideation. Since the pandemic, that number has risen to 60 to 75% of clinicians who are reporting um, exhaustion, burnout, depression, sleep disorders, PTSD. And it's a combination of staffing and overwhelm from patients and the fact that healthcare has you know, become more of a business, whereas a lot of the clinicians got into the field because they really just wanted to help people not have to manage a lot of the business aspects of it. And so as a result of, for example, dealing with really chronically ill patients and the overwhelm from that, healthcare workers experience vicarious traumatization. They have compassion fatigue. They're trying to care for Uh, you know, a variety of people dealing with really significant challenges and still have enough energy to go home and and provide that support to their own family and yet still have the ability to take care of themselves. And when we talk about burnout, most people think it's just exhaustion, but it's really about the fact that your emotional needs are not being met. So the goal of resilience is to create a buffer zone, basically the capacity to absorb the shocks and the bumps that we know will inevitably thrown out, be thrown at us. The average person experiences five to six traumas in a lifetime, uh, healthcare workers most likely more. And so there's really two ways to think about it. You can decrease the demands and the stressors, which is not always possible or you can increase your capacity and the resources you have available to deal with those things. And the framework that I present to hospitals and medical teams all over the world is is pretty simple and straightforward. It's developing a resilient mindset, skill set, and the ability to reset. And I'm happy to dive more into those if you'd like. If you would, please. Sure. So the mindset is understanding our brain. You know, it's a it's an amazing organ, more powerful than the world's fastest supercomputer. But your brain doesn't care if you're happy or have work life balance or, or feel peace and contentment. Its job is to keep you alive. So it's constantly scanning the environment for threats. Unfortunately, as we've evolved, our brain doesn't know the difference between a real or a perceived threat. So it, it literally can't tell the difference between a snarky email or a, a critical emergency situation. And so what happens is the more often we're in a threat state, the easier it is for our brain to default there. And if we're not really deliberate about using our brain to work for us, then it's constantly drawing us to the negative, anything that can hurt us just as a protection mechanism. So one of the things we know about the brain is that uncertainty and change, which we have had no shortage of, is the greatest threat of all that your brain perceives. So your brain would rather have an outcome that it doesn't like than one that it doesn't know. And just understanding that is enough to arm you with the fact that one, it's okay to not be okay. There is nothing wrong with you if you don't feel happy all the time. Happiness is an emotion like any other. But it's also understanding how do I use my mind to train my brain because that's all it is. It's a collection of habits. And so for example, one of those is how you view stress. 
stress, for example, in and of itself is not actually that harmful in small acute doses. It's chronic long-term overexposure to cortisol and adrenaline that starts to degrade parts of the brain and cause inflammation. It's how I ended up with a tumor in my face after raising my severely mentally ill and autistic son. You know, it just, there was nowhere for the stress to go. So part of it is how you're shifting the way you look at stress and realizing it's just an alarm system for your body. You can reset your nervous system at any time. The skill set is really the resources that you're using to build the buffer. So most people think, how can I reduce stress? Well, for healthcare workers, that's not always realistic. So while it would seem like that would be the direction you want to go, it actually primes your brain to start focusing on the stress. The research shows that if you want to offset your stress response and build your resources and capacity, rather than try to reduce the negative, you actually have to increase positive emotions. So really engaging in activities that have been scientifically proven to shift the brain in the right direction. So for example, social connection is your ability to connect with people and and have a deep, meaningful relationship with someone. That's the number one predictor of long-term happiness and longevity. More people die of loneliness every year than smoking, high blood pressure, and obesity. Gratitude practices, for example, shift your brain away from its natural negativity bias, which is our propensity to magnify negative experiences and minimize positive ones. And so gratitude and optimism and humor and and cultivating these emotions offsets the stress response. Self-care, for example, we know that, you know, sleep without adequate sleep, which a lot of healthcare workers don't get, uh, you're at increased risk for almost every mental health issue as well as physical health issues. Um, So it's looking at self-care differently, not as it being selfish or self-indulgent, but as a requirement to have the emotional reserves needed to combat burnout and stress. And then the reset is really learning how to intentionally control your nervous system. So I said a few seconds ago or a few minutes ago that basically your your stress is just an alarm system for the brain and it activates the sympathetic response, which you know, your pupils dilate and your heart rate increases, respiration, your body's been activated, so it's on a state of alert. The interesting part of that, though, is that your body doesn't know if what's causing that is positive or negative. So you could be running from a tiger or you could be winning or you could win the lottery and your body has the exact same response. The only difference is the interpretation your brain makes. So you can learn to tap into the power of your nervous system to activate the parasympathetic response, which is, you know, rest and digestion and, and all of the things that are more calming. And so it's it's really just a skill of learning how to do that. Within that skill set and this resilience toolbox, how important is the development of the skill to recognize when you are being stressed uh, rather than just for lack of a better term, soldiering through, uh, there has to be, you know, uh, some type of indicator that, hey, you know, I may feel okay, I may be uh, displaying okay behavior, but I'm not okay. So stress, chronic stress degrades gray matter density of the brain. And what that means, you can grow it back, but what that means is if you're starting to feel more irritable or you're starting to be more cynical or critical or skeptical or negative or you're feeling more tired and and typical rest isn't recharging you or you're feeling just, you know, this, I can't keep up with the demands. It's just overwhelming and there's too much. That's a sign that your body is reacting to a stress response. And before it gets to the point of burnout and exhaustion, that's like these practices are really meant to be proactive. You cultivate these things and they become habits and patterns. So that when you are in a stressful situation, you've already built up the skill set. Once you're there, then it's even more critical to take a step back and really ask yourself, is the way I'm working working for me? And if it's not reevaluating what that looks like, setting clear boundaries, communicating clear expectations, and, and really putting yourself first, you can empathize with patients, but you don't have to internalize everything that's happening. Give us a website where our listeners can learn more about you and learn about your books as well. 
Sure. Mind Over Moment is the newest book, and it's basically an expansion of this framework that I talked about. You can learn more at anngradygroup.com, A-N-N-E, gradygroup.com. Great. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for helping us out here on Health Professional Radio. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. You too, Neil. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Ann Grady. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, listen in, download at Anchor, Spotify, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Health Professional Radio.